thank you very much to the Lord Brown of Mattingly, John, for this afternoon, uh, for being here from the UK and uh, in a very busy time in your travel schedule. Uh, John's just written yet another great book, Make, Think, Imagine, and we'll get a little bit of context on that and then try to wrap up in time for any questions from the field here. So this book in particular is, is very positive. I consider it kind of a history of problem solving. That said, the problems that we're said to be facing right now are potentially multiple extinction level risks. I'm not always sure if I believe that. Some days I do, some days I don't. But as an engineer and a student of the uh, ingenuity of, of humans in, in history, how do you feel about the scale of problems we're facing as a civilization today and, and any favorites? Well, good afternoon. Uh, first, I thought those uh, presentations were extraordinarily insightful. And since I was here last year, uh, I, some of them had gone uh, leaps and bounds. Uh, and that, I think, uh, is uh, the, the tone of where I think some of these threats might have gone. They've got uh, bigger uh, and probably more uh, defined. Uh, to, to my mind, first of all, I'm a, quite a born optimist. I think I'm a clear-eyed optimist. I believe that uh, uh, engineering and business are there to provide solutions not to sit uh, around wringing hands and saying that the end is nigh. I don't think that's our role, and I don't think it's the role of anyone in this room based on the sample of people I've spoken to. However, I think there are two really big unintended consequences, uh, and they weren't intended when things started, but they were unintended outcomes of great progress. Uh, and they are around probably... Uh, and looking at the world saying, maybe we can end this world for you uh, if you don't play your cards properly. And one is obviously in the biomedical field. Uh, it's antimicrobial resistance. Uh, the, uh, the, on the advent of antibiotics, of course, has saved a huge number of lives uh, brought to us by the advent of penicillin, which incidentally might have been uh, discovered by the three Nobel laureates who, who got the Nobel Prize for it, but actually was made by an extraordinary chemical engineer called Margaret uh, Hutchinson Russo, Margaret Russo Hutchinson. Uh, she was uh, living in the Midwest and a uh, completely unsung hero who made an impossible, an unstable product into 650 billion units of, uh, of which uh, saved a lot of lives during the Second World War. So, uh, but I think the problem here is uh, it is an existential threat. We don't know uh, which of these uh, particular uh, virulent uh, um, uh, organisms will come and kill us. Uh, there are 19 at the moment, uh, and every year the number expands. And while you could eventually engineer uh, an antibiotic for one of them, by the time you got that done, uh, a lot of people would die, and maybe an enormous number of people would die. So that's threat one. Uh, and threat two in my book is, of course, climate change. It's really very simple. If we don't do anything about it, uh, we're going to heat the world up quite uh, significantly. Uh, at our present course, I think, uh, depending on how pessimistic you look at, how pessimistic the forecasters are, and what they take into account, anywhere between three and six degrees, which would rather quite dramatically change uh, the world around us. So those two things we've got to handle, both have solutions. Strangely, I think climate change has a more tractable solution than antimicrobial resistance. Uh, it is a matter of engineering, which we have. Uh, it's uh, engineering uh, products and solutions that can, that can get better if they're rolled out at at scale and quickly, but they need a change in public policy to make that possible. Economic signals really matter. Uh, and secondly, replacing all the growth in energy demand, not by hydrocarbons, but by new forms of energy, all of which is very possible. Right, so AI and nuclear war are not high on that list? No, I don't think so. I think nuclear war, uh, I think we've got a very comfortable uh, 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 mutually assured destruction, uh, um, um, equilibrium, metastable equilibrium. But I think so far, 
so good, I put it as a lower threat. I, I'm not with the people in the Pugwash um, conference who believe it will, will, will uh, eliminate the world. Uh, I, there are other, of course, threats from different forms of weapons. Uh, but every time there's a threat, I think we are engineering a solution to them. Drones have been a big problem, uh, especially around airfields. I know that in the UK. We've had plenty of people who want to disturb uh, what goes on in the UK. Flight patterns, they're very dangerous things, uh, but they can, be they can be disarmed very easily by uh, changing the signaling to them. And if push comes to shove, you can get them out of the air with a, a laser. So uh, you, you can actually sort that out. I think AI is mostly, I would say, uh, if it is a threat, it's a very long-term threat. I think the biggest threat is for us to really buy all the hype and take it very seriously. I think there's an awful lot of exaggeration in this area, in particular on its threat. I think there are some much bigger uh, social threats uh, to do with uh, computation and privacy and connectivity uh, that I think many people are aware of in this room uh, that we have to handle in advance of that. There's a, an interesting, <clears throat> interesting quote that comes to mind that a fire alarm is not most impactful in telling you there's a fire in the building. It's in telling you everybody else knows there's a fire in the building, so it's not embarrassing to run out. And people like Elon Musk and others who are making a big clamor about AI apocalypse risk, that seems to be their underlying motivation, is let's actually talk about and think about and address the risk. It's not necessarily going to destroy us tomorrow, but it's better than kind of whistling through the graveyard. Uh, ab ab absolutely. But I think equally, uh, as we peel through these risks uh, and we see the, uh, the advent of them, something happens, uh, we do something, albeit late, we nonetheless respond to it. And our response time is slightly better. It's a response time not only with engineering around a problem, uh, but also uh, regulation and, uh, and eventually the law. It's behavior, regulation, the law, uh, not necessarily in that order uh, that gets things done. All right. So taking a, a bit of a step back, you've had, you are having a, a pretty interesting career. Uh, I've had a lot of broad exposure to top decision makers around the globe and are one yourself. As chairman and CEO of BP, as a member of the boards of Intel and Goldman Sachs, as a member of the House of Lords, as chairman of the Tate, as a member of the Crick Institute, the list goes on and on. One of the things you're most well known for is a speech you gave in 1997 in California where you were the first big oil major executive to speak publicly about the risk of global warming and investment in renewable energy. Economically, that would have been very difficult at the time. How did your shareholders react then? And I'll follow up with the next part of the question. So I think there were probably two things that when I went to my board of directors at BP and to talk to them about risks, real risks, where I said, I think if we're going to invest money where we could lose it all, but it's worth doing, there were really two things. The first was entering into Russia uh, and uh, in, uh, in the late 90s, uh, where we put uh, what nowadays is a very small amount of money, half a billion dollars, uh, into an investment. And I discussed with the board saying, we're going to lose it all. And it almost looked like we did. And then we made many tens of billions of dollars of profit instead. So that was worked out OK. But it was very, uh, very nerve-wracking during the transition. Uh, and second was an investment in uh, alternative energy. Because we first uh, had, uh, we did two things which were very bad. We were wrong. One is we were stuck with uh, an idea, which was a legacy idea, that we should be making solar panels. This was before China really decided to take off in this area. Uh, and secondly, we went into wind and picked the wrong technology. Other than that, everything was great. Uh, and, uh, but it certainly taught us a lot uh, and taught us how to think about energy on a wider scale by doing something. But rather more importantly, it began, began to give us what I, what I really needed was a seat at the table to discuss with 
people who did not want hydrocarbon energy to grow, uh, how, we, how the energy system of the world would begin to develop. And I thought that was a better position to have than have people in other rooms talking about the future of the company that I was uh, running uh, without my being there. So uh, you always get trade-offs when I, uh, perhaps I may know that when I made the speech, which put firm accountability for emissions of CO2 in the hands of the oil and gas business, um, and I said, here's the actions, uh, I'm afraid I was excommunicated, uh, as, the, uh, as my colleague said from the American Petroleum Institute. I hadn't realized I was a member of that church, uh, but nonetheless, I was excommunicated, and I felt good about that. All right. By the way, 1997, another major world breakthrough led by the British, the Spice Girls. The world uh, wants to know, valuable. who is your favorite Spice Girl? Uh, well, it has to be Victoria Beckham, doesn't it? Cultural icon. So there, there seems to be a corollary, potentially a similarity between the world of, of the mid to late 90s, the emergence of renewables as a viable but deeply in the red on a unit economic or any real economic basis, but engineering-wise possible solution, or at least innovation, to today, as more and more people are seriously starting to talk about geoengineering, uh, direct air carbon capture, for example, uh, potentially large-scale seasonal energy storage fits in that category, all the way to Dyson spheres. How do you feel about the physics and the engineering capability of those as solutions and as a business person? Would you invest in them now the way you would have pushed for renewables in 97? Well, the answer is in some with small amounts of money. Uh, but uh, because I'd want to see uh, great people uh, going from one a great idea to an even better idea. A and maybe they produce something worthwhile. C can I just step back, though? It, it seems to me you know, the world is, goes through, in the energy business, goes through trans big changes once in a while. And the, the, the most recent ones in the last 20 years have really been the following. Uh, in the late 90s, uh, the energy industry discovered how really to process seismic to reduce exploration risk, a technological change, and they were able to do all that because suddenly the world changed when the Berlin Fort Wall came down and the Iron Curtain collapsed. So we had a change in technology and a change in politics. So we come back to uh, 2006 or so, uh, we suddenly actually realized what uh, some very interesting entrepreneurs had done for a little while, which was to uh, drill very long horizontal wells and hydraulically frack them. Uh, and hence uh, the Permian, where I worked once a very long time ago, uh, had a, 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 a renaissance. Something big happened. And what's more, it happened in the country where it was permitted to happen. That was the political part. And now we come to today where we see changes in the way in which we think about energy systems and what we can do to reduce emissions of CO2 and methane from those systems. And what is happening politically is that uh, I think most populations certainly started in Europe and spreading to the US uh, and elsewhere people are observing the weather and relating that to climate. That may, that may well be the case, but they're worrying about that. They're seeing an ever-present danger, and they want more things done. And younger generations want even more things done because they're educated about what might happen if we play this game out to its conclusion. So on the technology side, the engineered products, there, of course, is an explosion of them. And that's exactly what there should be. And some will die and some will win. Uh, and I'm very happy to see that. I think there are some basic things which will carry on. But the biggest thing we've, I think, got to shift to is this. Seems to me uh, that uh, uh, it's unlikely that we can reduce global consumption 
of hydrocarbons to, to much below the today's level. I don't think it'll grow much from today's level either for the next 20 years. So in that case, we have to simply decarbonize the hydrocarbons. A and there are definitely engineering process to, to do that. They just need to be now tuned, uh, they're really tuned up and really deployed with scale because the more scale, as you all know, uh, the cheaper the units become and the more learning you have. So for that, we need something which prices carbon, either a positive or a negative one, an economic signal is really needed to make this happen. Uh, and that, uh, that's the missing element. Meanwhile, we can develop lots of other things to do with energy systems from storage. You know, batteries uh, have a little bit of a problem. They're reaching a, a rather important thermodynamic limit. So uh, we need to think about different ways of doing that. Uh, but there, there are other ways uh, through to extraordinary items that uh, we see today. And then we have all the work uh, to do what all engineers, engineering products do to optimize, uh, run them better, get them more efficient. All right. So uh, the construction outside of the building that, that uh, led some of us to take the other way around here is because a new installation is being added. It's a reusable rocket from the SpaceX program. There are certain uh, initiatives going on around the world with uh, Virgin Galactic just going public and obviously Deep Blue, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Blue Horizon, Blue Origins, and SpaceX uh, extending the boundary of human engineering. And we, we jokingly refer to Dyson Spheres, which is the concept of building a, a panel of mirrors around the sun to harness that energy. But are there any science fiction solutions or projects that, that you maybe remember from your engineering days or have looked at uh, less seriously in your career that you think are now suddenly becoming viable or uh, investable? So uh, after I'd practiced as a field engineer, I, uh, I, I was asked by my boss uh, who came into the office and asked an extraordinary question. Does anyone know how to run a computer in this office? And said, so I said, I do. You know, I was a very arrogant young man and I worked at Cambridge in the computer laboratory. Uh, and he said, well, we want to uh, solve a, a big simulation problem. What simulation? I said, let me take care of it. I had no idea really what I was doing, but I was confident enough I could solve it. So I, I actually made a di literally a digital twin of the Prudhoe Bay oil field uh, right down to uh, Los Angeles where uh, the oil was delivered. And I always said to myself, you know, the problem with this is these machines are very stupid uh, and they actually don't, uh, they, they're they very unreliable. And so I was always wanting more and more and more. And today, of course, we have all of it. But we don't see a lot of it. It's 50 years worth of uh, hardware development, courtesy of IBM and Intel and other people. People ignore all that nowadays. Uh, they just think it's there like, uh, uh, like uh, you know, just like a bathroom. It's there. Uh, and uh, But what is extraordinary about this is it uh, enables us to do things that we haven't thought about that might make a real science fiction thing happen. And that is to use ultra big data, ultra, ultra big data, and to figure out how to diagnose a person, eliminating all first line physicians and giving them a prognosis of the future. So things that like sort of Star Trek, really. Uh, we don't have to have these unreliable experts involved with working out what we should do to a human. We need them for empathy. That's a different matter. Uh, but the expert is contained somewhere, and maybe for the most important problems, they're right at the end of the chain. But this, I think, could be uh, an, an, and will be an extraordinary breakthrough that... Uh, I, I hope I'm around to see. All right. One last one before we open it up. You've been a champion for diversity, inclusion, and equity. And for better or worse, there's a lot of dudes in this room. We'd like to have a more diverse industry. What, what initiatives or, or incentives can you see? There have been interesting studies proposing, for example, that, that certain demographics get paid more earlier in their career or... Uh, 
any other creative solutions. Do you see anything being discussed now that you think is a truly innovative solution to well, having more diverse workplace as just opposed to just... Repeat why this is so important, other than the fact is that it's right and it reflects a human right of everybody to be treated absolutely equally. But it's about uh, avoiding bias in everything that we make or think about. And every time I go and see people, they worry desperately about this. Certainly, I mean, as we know, in, in Silicon Valley, it's still quite a lot of men around doing men things. And built-in bias is really, really bad. And secondly, it's about inclusion, which when you lead a company, you know very well that if you get inclusion wrong, people don't think they're members of a team. And when they're not members of a team, they're not engaged, and they just don't work well. Now, I think uh, and the, the more obvious points are uh, that you deny yourself access to a very large number of people if you don't get a, 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 the proper approach to including people into uh, an organization, institution, or society. So I've, I have no new techniques except this. It seems to me that it's always inappropriate for anyone to have a list of candidates for a job that is not fully inclusive and diverse. If, if I ever see that as a chairman of a board, I express with, with great clarity why I think it's wrong. It really is wrong. And so it's the list of people you examine. And the second thing is the people who are making the selection. They too have to represent what it is you really want to do. And then you can get real merit with diversity uh, through the system, I believe. I'm sure there are other things to do, but I've always found this is the most practical thing. And it's also a litmus test for an organization because if people don't do it naturally, you begin to wonder what is it they have in their structure that is biasing the way in which selections are made. I look at it for, you know, uh, openly gay people, for example. Uh, I, I think everybody knows in the uh, S&P 500, uh, the most famous openly gay CEO is Tim Cook. It took Tim some time to come out. Uh, but can anyone think of the next 24 that should be there? The minimum number, I think, of gay people should be around about 5%, maybe 10. But if we have 500, there should be 24 more people. I think you'd be hard pressed to find them. In fact, I think openly gay, I think the data shows about three or four in the S&P 500. So my observation is something's going wrong here. Uh, either people are not being selected, there's bigotry, bias, or else they're, they're copying, they're, they're deciding to elect out because they don't like to be exposed, or something else is happening. They're so worried about being like everybody else that they're hiding away, like I did for many, many years. But that was a little while ago. I don't excuse it. Uh, but uh, given my background, I, you know, when I was um, when I was growing up. Uh, if you were gay and you had a sexual relationship, you went to prison. Uh, and besides, my, my late mother, who, managed, who survived Auschwitz, uh, always told me two things. Never tell anyone a secret, because they'll use it against you, for sure. And secondly, worry about being an identifiable member of a minority, because when the going gets tough, the majority always hurt the minority. We need to change both of those things. Uh, but that uh, forced me, or persuaded me, that it was dangerous to be myself until I was outed. Well, thank you for that. And uh, and more more simplistically, we all work across markets from from the Permian Basin to Silicon Valley, where people will go across the street, quit your company for a ten percent pay bump. So having an inclusive, comfortable, and motivating workplace is is really a business imperative. I think I would say. I'd delete the word comfortable, I'd say appropriate. You know, it's whatever that means. All right. Well, I'd like to open it up for any questions. 
So uh, I think the always the, the most difficult uh, decision always is uh, building a team and then uh, concluding that you have to change it. Uh, everybody delays that, uh, and in delaying it, usually they make the situation worse. So, and it's because people are human, and I think that's actually a good thing. You know, we're not machines, uh, but need to change people Ask them, asking them to leave, uh, changing a team is, in my mind, always the single most difficult internal process decision you have to make. I think making decisions on strategy, on finance, on balance sheet structure, all this sort of thing, easy compared with the real, uh, uh, the real business of a leader is to build a great team uh, that is going to effectively deliver all the other things that people decide and do it better than you ever have imagined yourself. That's, I think that's the real skill and the most difficult decision to make. Um, I think the most difficult per personal decision was actually the moment uh, I was uh, outed. Uh, I, um, so here's what happened. Uh, as uh, I... Um, I decided to go into the closet when I was about 20 and throw away the key and stay there forever. Gave you the reasons. And I did that, and I thought it was quite good fun to run two lives. It was a bit like being a spy, you know, uh, the fiction and the reality and, and keeping them separate. It was great until I got to a point where uh, I got to be very well known. So more people know, knew who I was than I knew who they were. And so danger rose. So I decided to go even further uh, into the closet. And I ended up um, uh, actually try building a relationship with an, a gay escort. That was a bad decision. Uh, and then uh, it was really bad error of judgment. And then secondly, uh, he uh, left and I thought nothing of it. Uh, and the next thing I got was a phone call from a tabloid newspaper who said, well, we've just bought a story about your personal life from your former boyfriend. Here are 39 questions. Do you have any comments? So the questions were horrendous. Uh, so I said no, uh, but I got hold of a lawyer and said, we've got to bottle this up. Uh, and I used a, what, what I think is commonly called a saber-tooth lawyer, uh, someone really really bad. Uh, they're very nice and very qualified, but, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, as long as you're the client. Uh, and uh, so, uh, uh, and this all worked badly because when asked by this lawyer I'd never met before, how did you meet this guy? I, I didn't tell the truth uh, in a witness statement. I, fortunately, it wasn't on the stand. It wasn't perjury, but it, but it was a second bad error of judgment. It was a small, small thing, but in my mind, it grew very big. So all this went on and uh, eventually went through various uh, appeals. In fact, I created a brand new piece of law in the Supreme Court, which was very comforting for my lawyers, not so good for me. Uh, and I lost uh, on this basis uh, and I was outed. And at that point, I realized that I had had a model of the world in my head which said the most important thing is to be like everybody else. And I suddenly wasn't. And I thought the world would actually collapse, that I would, nobody would uh, like me, nobody would do business with me, and I wouldn't be able to go to any country in the world uh, because I might be excluded on the basis of my sexuality. So I was uh, a global uh, press star for three days, I mean, literally all over the world. And on the day four, of course, it stopped. The paparazzi didn't follow me on motorbikes anymore. And so I went out uh, to shop. I had to do that. And I started being stopped in the street by people 
who kept saying, we're right behind you. And I didn't know who these people were. Uh, and then I started getting a mailbag. I got a huge mailbag uh, where I realized that my assumptions were all wrong. And actually, people like people who are actually themselves. And it kind of works out fine. But it was one of the most extraordinary moments in my life. And I decided at that point, incidentally, I, I, I resigned from BP because I didn't want BP to go through this. And I think it was not appropriate to be there. Probably it was convenient for the board of directors for me to go because uh, it's never good to have a too controversial CEO. Uh, and I actually resigned from everything I was doing, uh, uh, which uh, gave me a very interesting, rather chilling moment uh, after having been very busy for over 40 years with nothing to do. And that was actually a very good thing uh, because I figured out later about a month that I wasn't going to retire and something else happened and the rest is, is history. So it was uh, an odd moment, uh, to put it in a very British way, uh, but it was a very important moment. And I think it does demonstrate that you know, tough stuff which happens to people changes them, uh, changes direction, and it usually works out okay. Not always, but usually does. Ask the boss if we have time for one more. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see, Anthony and Arcady, uh, maybe if you can each make them really quick. Appreciate your comments. You, you said what I was thinking about the movement of the companies from last year to this year. Could you elaborate a little <laughs> bit more about your thoughts on what's overstated or understated as it relates to AI? I went into an Amazon fulfillment center last year and the boring company tunnel this year. And I was thinking about your limits and ther thermodynamics that you commented on and, and how people change our thinking. And so, I, I mean, I, let me be very clear. I, I, I believe the, in the power of AI hugely, hugely. Uh, and uh, application after application is working very well from the things that make life convenient to better medical diagnosis for very specific and certain complaints only. Uh, and the list goes on. And the learning processes and mechanisms are, are very good. Do I actually think that we will find an, a, an artificial general intelligence, which is where I think people are moving their thinking? I think that's a very tough problem. It's a very tough problem because we don't actually have a real definition of general intelligence, first of all. Uh, and most engineering solutions require you to have a form of definition, at least some clear goal. Uh, so I think that's one problem. And the second problem is in looking at brain function, which we do at the Crick Institute, we're, we're quite good at this. You know, we've got four Nobel laureates and 25 fellows of the Royal Society, the list goes on. Um, I, I, the more I listen to people, the more I realize how very complex uh, the challenge of the brain is. You know, we can understand, it's a bit like where we are with AI. You can understand a function. So we understand how a fruit fly smells. We understand that after lots of years of work. Do we understand how a whole of a mouse brain works? No, that's far too complicated. Do we understand what we're really doing with sensors in the brain in a human? It's a bit hit and miss. You know, so you go down to DARPA, you can see, you know, uh, you can see impulse, uh, impulse controlled prosthetic limbs, uh, but it's experimental. You know, we don't quite understand what's going on there. So, and it will take a long time. There's some very exciting stuff going on. And indeed, I talk about it a lot in the book coming back, I have to do this for my publisher. Uh, so, uh, but I do think the one, I start, at the end of the book, I decided, what am I gonna say about uh, AI? Because uh, it's what everybody wants to talk about, or one of the things. And, and I realized that, you know, one of the things which is so different with the exceptional characteristic of the human being is the human being's ability to imagine, really imagine. So to find things to uh, construct in your mind which have never existed, 
uh, in places that have never you've never been to, possibly never exist, at times which uh, uh, have not been experienced with people who don't exist. Uh, all these sorts of things are the things probably which are the exceptional character of the human mind. Uh, and I want to keep it like that for the time being. If archaeology finds this book in 100 years' time and says, what a curious way of thinking, then I'll be happy with that too. But for now, I think uh, this is where I, I, I think we are limited. Interestingly, of course, AI, people forget how the beginnings of that uh, managed to get the airplanes, the fuel, the bombs, and the pilots into the right places during the Second World War. It was pretty primitive, but that's what they were trying to do. You know, it's, it's said it takes about 20 years to program a human. So as a father of a nearly newborn now, I'm, I'm eagerly reading the research papers from DeepMind and Watson and seeing who's going to do a better job over the next 20 years. <laughs> uh, Arcadia, quick one. Sure. Um, there's a major climate protest happening in London right now, not too far away from where BP's executive offices are in St. James Square. And I'm curious, do you think that this climate protest, one, will have an impact on public policy and private enterprise in the UK specifically? And two, some of the activists in this protest are uh, very much against improving the hydro hydrocarbon ecosystem. In fact, they just want to eliminate it entirely. Yeah. So I assume that you won't be able to reach a point of agreement on that. And what do you think will happen if the two sides don't get to this, this agreement? Well, I think a general rule, if you ask for something that actually cannot be done, it is the art of the impossible, then uh, it won't happen. You know, I mean, all solutions are about the art of the possible, the soluble. So, you know, pick a array of things to do. You have to pick the one that probably in some ways can be solved. So uh, I think on that basis, they will fail, but they will succeed by upping the temperature of the debate. And they are succeeding most definitely in that. And they're drawing attention to something which probably should be uh, should be made more clear. I think what they do is, in the end, you know, all public policy is shaped by the way in which the population is reacting, the opinion poll, and lots of other things. Uh, and they're definitely pushing in Europe, not just in London, uh, the, the politicians to say, we must do something about this. And they've been trying, you know, they, they try with directive regulation, rather than open-ended regulation. So that probably won't work. Uh, then eventually, I think we'll get to the economic incentives and disincentives, the signals. Certainly the European Union, it's the number one thing on uh, the new president's uh, agenda. Solve this problem. Uh, and uh, let's see what happens. But I, I think uh, there's still a lot of dogma about eliminating hydrocarbons. I get it a lot, they say. Why are you still involved in this? And I said, it's obvious, you know. Uh, but uh, I think there's a lot of dogma. And dogma needs to be ignored. This has got to be a, a semi-rational process. If I can add one last point. I do think, however, the oil and gas industry must at all costs avoid becoming the tobacco industry. The tobacco industry became the way it did because when asked what they were accountable for, I think they said, well, we just make the cigarettes, we don't smoke them. And please remember that when you think about scope three emissions. I think uh, the oil and gas industry makes the carbon, as it were, by extracting it, and it needs a, a high degree, maybe not all the degree, but a high degree of accountability of all the emissions uh, that come out of it. And they can't be solved at once, but it's always, always very good. A rule of a rule of law, I think, is find the point of half-life and make that the target and see what happens then. Very well. We could go all day, but I know we've got more companies to present, and you have a speech to give at the Natural History Museum do. downtown. So thank you very much for taking some time with us and being a great supporter of Blue Bear and our companies over the last few years, and look forward to continuing the discussion. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.